They, um, what I want to do is, is talk about um, giving you kind of an understanding of some of the fundamentals. Uh, some of the things I'll talk about will be a bit more advanced perhaps. But uh, the idea being you'll be able to have then an intelligent conversation if you're just starting out and you're working with a sleep doctor or a sleep technologist. At the same time, I think it'll help reinforce some of the uh, good habits to get into. So some of the objectives today, um, we're going to talk about evaluating the efficacy or effectiveness of oral appliance therapy for sleep apnea. We'll talk about some of the details on sleep disorder breathing, um, when to use a home sleep test, when it's appropriate to do that, um, some of the technologies that's going to be involved. Now, well, what we have here is some of the electrodes on, and they're being presented in this instance with visual stimuli. And in event-related potentials, what we're doing is we're averaging raw EEG that's going on, we're just presenting a stimulus and a stimulus and a stimulus, and then we're averaging it out here. And when we average it out, we can then tell different parts of, of the brain whether or not they're behaving properly or if they're functioning properly. Here for the time base between 0 and 50 milliseconds after the uh, initiation of the stimulus, they're typically either auditory or, or visual, we can tell, at least in this case, brains and auditory uh, evoked uh, potentials. And in this instance, you can see if you've got the W1 and W2 wave, then you're looking primarily at cranial name, uh, nerve number 8. And here you have the middle latency responses from 0 to 80. Um, for the subsequent uh, 50 to 500 milliseconds, you can actually now look at some of the more psychological uh, aspects. For example, here we have the P1 and P2, um, but you see this line right here, that's actually when they presented a different stimulus. So in many cases, they'll look at the memory and potentials and, and say, okay, we're going to have the person pay attention and they can see different changes in the waveform and try to associate this with what's going on in the neuronal level. And here again, you can see negative up, positive down. There's entire books written on this, this waveform right here called P3. We're not going to get any, we're not going to talk about that today, but just to let you know that, that is, there's entire books written on just that one waveform. So what we're going to talk a bit more about is the what's going on during sleep. So here you've got stage one, you can see the EEG. As it becomes more synchronized, you get a higher amplitude in stage two. That's a K-complex. If you want to listen to K-complex in the sleep lab, all you got to do is clap your hands. So when they occur spontaneously, one of the theories is that there's like an endogenous, stimu endogenous stimulation of the auditory mechanisms. And you can, again, evoke that just by clapping your hands and we'll start seeing complexes during the report. Now in the older days, as I mentioned, we subdivided into stages three and four. That's now been combined into deep sleep. So when people talk about deep sleep, they're talking about this. And you can see the profound change here, where you've got these slow waves, where you can see some of the neuronal fibrosis disorder in children. You see that, you just start saying, okay, well, what's going on here? Do they snore? Is there a narrow airway? You know, what's going on uh, with the child, I think. Uh, so we've already talked about three types of apnea, cessation of airflow. Uh, it's really key that, in my opinion, that you measure airflow, otherwise, you know, you're not necessarily measuring properly. We are talking about, after all, cessation of airflow. Uh, hypopnea, under breathing for 10 or more seconds. Um, so this is what you want to see as a normal breathing, that's sinusoidal activity. And that's good. You see, what we're looking for then is changes in the uh, y-axis and the x-axis. And this is all perfectly sinusoidal. There's no real change. There's nothing going on. This is central sleep apnea, where you have a cessation of airflow, you have a cessation of effort, ventilatory effort on both chest and abdomen. I have a vacuum cleaner and I unplug it. I get a total cessation of uh, negative pressure because the motor is off. The exact same thing's happening right here. And this is in a good nocturnal area because this person had no apnea. No, it was like 0 0.5. It was nothing. But this is an example of what you can get just on a regular healthy person. Now here's another case of uh, central apnea. We actually did, uh, at one of the recent conferences, we had someone who was diagnosed with apnea, was on CPAP. We did a test. Uh, it turns out that the apnea was not obstructive. And then the second night, we did the test with uh, the CPAP and repeated the test. His apnea got worse. It went from 24 on the baseline night to 30. On the second day with the CPAP because it was predominantly apnea, uh, central apnea. So with central apnea, if you have this, you cannot use an oral appliance because you're talking central respiratory mechanisms and brain stem, they're already shutting down. In which case you want to go on uh, something like uh, ASB or adaptive cerebral ventilation from the resume. 
And that's kind of like a more sophisticated seat valve, closer to a ventilator, and it analyzes on a breath-by-breath -breath basis and encourages the person to start breathing. So that's really key. That's why it's key to make sure you've got to know what you're dealing with when you're actually talking about, I don't know how this person ended up getting the seat valve with the fact that they had central apnea. But they did. And you don't want to go there. Uh, so with, uh, with an obstructive apnea, you've got uh, continued ventilatory effort here and no desaturation afterwards. So here's some cases here. So we're looking at snoring audio. And it's interesting. Look here on the snoring audio. Nothing going on here. Here you got a flat line. Here you have continued ventilatory effort. Uh, the sum channel kind of confirms that you've got paradoxical effort. So during an obstructive event, if you put your hand on the intake of the vacuum cleaner, you hear the motor starting to strain. The exact same thing happens in the human body. And if you think of it this way, you've got an obstruction of the upper airway. If you close your mouth, plug your nose, try to breathe, you will no longer be synchronized. Your chest and abdomen will become desynchronized like this. And that's what we're 